Ultimate weapons are often placed within games as trophies, granting the player unrivaled power as a reward for their deeds. Often, such rewards would come at great sacrifice to a player's time or patience, but even though their acquisition often ended up being quite ironic, as by wielding such power any challenges left within the game would become quite trivial, there has always been something rather satisfying about squaring off against the game's big bad and striking them down in one fell swoop. Three years ago, we produced a video that featured some of the most difficult ultimate weapons to obtain. It featured the likes of Excalibur 2 from Final Fantasy IX and the Onion Knight from Final Fantasy X that required expert knowledge of dodging lightning bolts. And looking back, it's crazy to see that that video has now been viewed almost 1.3 million times. Wow! When we pulled together that last collection of weapons, we had a strong focus on the main numbered games. But today, we're relaxing that focus as we run through another 7 ultimate weapons that are incredibly hard to obtain, and we're going to kick things off with, you guessed it, Kaladbolg from Final Fantasy X. But before we do, I'd first like to talk a little bit about the next video we're going to publish, part 2 of the complete history of Square. Throughout, we will talk in significant detail about the numerous events that took place that ultimately built up to the release of Final Fantasy back in 1987, and I'd encourage you all to subscribe and turn on notifications so you get informed the moment it's published. We'd also like to let you know that YouTube has just launched a new initiative called Super Thanks. If you like our work but aren't interested in joining our Patreon or supporting us through YouTube memberships, Super Thanks allows you to give a one-off donation to the channel to show your appreciation for the content we produce. As an added bonus, you'll also have your comment highlighted on the specific video you chose to give thanks to. If you're interested, you can access this new feature through the big thanks button. And with that, let's get on to the video. Final Fantasy X has gained quite the reputation over the years owing to the ridiculous obstacles put before players that dared to obtain the game's strongest weapons, which in this particular instance were named the Celestial Weapons. Some tested patience, as denoted by the amount of time that players would need to dedicate to Blitzball in order to obtain the Jupiter Sigil, a key component in the acquisition of Waka's ultimate weapon, World Champion. Others required skill, like the Aeon Jewels against Balgamine that needed to be won in order to obtain the Moon Sigil, an item needed for Yuna's Nirvana, and the Butterfly Hunt minigame that required the catching of blue butterflies without touching any red butterflies. Success in that endeavour bestowed players with the Saturn Sigil, a crucial component for Kimari's Spirit Lance. Dodging lightning bolts then required a combination of patience and skill, as players would need to dodge 200 consecutive lightning bolts without making a single mistake in order to obtain the Venus Sigil, a component required to obtain Lulu's ultimate weapon, Onion Knight. And then there was the Chocobo Racing minigame that needed to be completed in order to obtain the Sun Sigil, and today that is where we are going to focus our attention. Upon first inspection, the Chocobo Racing minigame didn't seem all that bad. You just had to beat the trainer while riding a Chocobo that didn't always do as it was told. Simple enough, but after overcoming that challenge, a new difficulty was added, and then another, and then another. One stage on from the Wobbly Chocobo was the Dodger Chocobo. While still controlling an uncooperative Chocobo, the player would now be tasked with avoiding blitz balls that were thrown in its path and would slow the Chocobo down if hit. Then there was Hyper Dodger Chocobo, which in addition to the previous two hurdles would add aggressive homing birds to the equation that would again slow the Chocobo down if they connected. The fourth tier then combined these three hindrances, while also adding a brand new hindrance. It meant that alongside attempting to wrestle with a Chocobo that would change its path at random, and avoiding blitz balls and birds that homed in on their target and slowed it down upon impact, they would also need to collect balloons and beat the trainer's time to be victorious. For each balloon collected, 3 seconds would be removed from the final race time, and for every blitz ball and bird that collided, 3 seconds would be added. And to make everything even more complicated, simply beating the trainer's time was not enough to unlock the sun sigil. Instead, the developers made it so that only those who beat the record time of 0 seconds would be granted with the reward, simply equaling it would be deemed unsatisfactory. That meant obtaining 0 seconds flat would not be enough to win, players had to hope and pray that they obtained a time that was below 0 seconds. 
unlike the other minigames, what made this one especially frustrating was that it was beyond requiring either skill or patience to succeed, it also required a huge slice of luck. But if luck was on your side, and it aligned with your skills also being on fire at the same time, then you would be the proud owner of a sun sigil, and Titus's celestial weapon, the Kalad Bolg. The ironic element is that years later, Yoshinori Kitase revealed that even though he didn't personally design many of the minigames featured around these celestial weapons, except for Blitzball of course, he did still approve them for use in the final game and was happy with the challenge they presented. But with hindsight, he also revealed that if he was creating Final Fantasy X right now for the modern gamer, he would probably have spent a little bit more time thinking about whether making them so difficult was such a good idea. Ever since its launch back in 2017, like any other persistent game, Dissidia Final Fantasy Opera Omnia has been receiving numerous updates to make characters gradually more powerful so that they can tackle challenges of ever increasing difficulty. In the initial sense, each character was granted access to a 5 star 15 CP weapon, these were then upgraded to 5 star 35 CP weapons, and they could be leveled up and limit broken by using resources and gill to achieve their maximum potential. EX weapons were then added alongside Chapter 11, and these could be upgraded to EX Plus weapons, but they too have now been replaced, as the most powerful weapons are currently Burst weapons in the global version, and an even stronger variant called the Burst Plus weapon that have been added to the Japanese version, and will be coming to the global version hopefully later this year. Needless to say, acquiring and then maximising a Burst weapon is no easy task, and the first hurdle is the wonderful Gacha mechanic. This requires the player to place their faith in Lady Luck, and when using tickets, the pull rate is only 0.1%. You can increase the odds ever so slightly by using gem pulls to 3%, but it's not all that forgiving. It's also just the first step. To upgrade the weapon completely, you will then need 800 weapon orbs and at least 250,000 gil, and in the Japanese version to then evolve them, you'll also need materials that can only be found in dungeons associated with the Lufania Plus difficulty, the hardest difficulty setting that currently exists in the game. Needless to say, only those with significant amounts of either luck, time or deep pockets will ever be able to obtain what are currently the strongest weapons in Opera Omnia but if they can be acquired, then players gain access to the burst phase. This can only be used by one character per battle, but it still makes the party incredibly powerful as it allows that character to unleash a barrage of unanswerable attacks, as well as granting a burst effect upon its completion. Sticking with the theme of obtaining a collection of weapons, as opposed to just a single entry, next up we're going to be talking about the ultimate weapons that could be obtained in Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions, specifically the version that appeared on the PlayStation Portable. For this re-release of Final Fantasy Tactics, which arrived almost 10 years after the original version had been released on the PlayStation, many, many changes were made. Almost all dialogue, locations, characters, items and jobs were retranslated, and the type of English speech was changed to sound more medieval and grand. Brand new cinematics were also introduced, there were numerous balancing tweaks and tons of new content was added, including new guest characters like Balthier from Final Fantasy XII to new jobs, additional story battles and side quests, and two entirely new multiplayer game modes called Melee and Rendezvous that were intended to make use of ad hoc play if people were close enough together to allow their PSPs to communicate wirelessly. On top of all of this, the developers also included a huge array of new weapons that were a considerable upgrade on those available in the base game, but they were only made available to those who decided to play Melee and Rendezvous, perhaps as a way of encouraging people to check out the new modes. Golden Axe, for example, had 30 attack power, almost double that of Slasher, the most powerful axe found in the base game, and the Onion Sword had a massive 50 attack, which was greater than any other sword in the game, irrespective of type, including the Chaos Blade. If you happened to play the game as intended, and played with a friend, to take part in and complete various multiplayer battles, many of these powerful weapons could be obtained. But it wasn't just a simple case of completing a specific set of requirements to obtain the weapon you wanted. No, there was of course a random element added to make things interesting, and no doubt, to encourage continued play. Upon completing a duty, a varying number of treasure chests would be granted as the reward, with the number based on how well you both performed throughout the battle. 
and their contents would also be varied, with the rarity of the items housed within determined by numerous factors including the average level of units chosen as well as the difficulty of the mission undertaken. When combined, this all meant that acquiring specific ultimate weapons was down to a combination of skill and just blind luck. But there was at least a slight notion of making your own luck, and you'd have the benefit of sharing the experience with someone else. Time has also presented a new barrier to acquisition. With the game now being released over 14 years ago, the chances of you being able to find someone locally who's got a PSP, a copy of War of the Lions, and wants to play multiplayer with you is rather limited meaning you'll realistically never be able to obtain any of the game's strongest weapons unless you have some awesome friends nearby that just want to spend time reminiscing with you. Fortunately, the developers realised this particular design flaw, and when War of the Lions was re-released on mobile devices, the previous method of acquiring the ultimate weapons was removed and replaced by them simply being granted as a reward for completing the game. For the fourth ultimate weapon on this list, we're going to look at an outlier in the franchise, Final Fantasy Legend 2. Technically, it is a saga game, as it was known as Saga 2 Legend of the Secret Treasure in Japan, but it does still carry the Final Fantasy branding outside of Japan, and even retained that name in its recent re-release on the Switch. Around the time of its original release, Ultimate Weapons often weren't all that hard to obtain. The original Final Fantasy granted players access to the Masamune via a chest in the final dungeon, and Final Fantasy II adopted a similar approach, granting access to Masamune, again via a chest hidden in the final dungeon. The Final Fantasy Legend continued this trend, as the glass sword could be found in a treasure chest in the tower, but for some reason, the development team working on its sequel chose to introduce the joys of random number generation into the equation. The Seven Sword, which when wielded could deal seven devastating attacks on foes, could only be found as a random drop after defeating a tough boss strength normal enemy called the Haniwas in the centre of the world. Haniwas themselves were a random encounter, only appearing in 10 out of every 256 encounters, but if you were strong enough to defeat them, and there are a few quick methods available to those who want to ensure victory, then there was only a small chance that the Seven Sword would even drop. It made this particular ultimate weapon very rare, but if you had the patience and luck, upon acquiring the Seven Sword, assuming you planned your party setup around maximising its damage output for when you had acquired it, then you would have a weapon at your disposal that would obliterate your enemies. The next weapon on our list isn't all that difficult to obtain, at least not in the initial sense, but it's been included due to what needs to be undertaken in order to maximise its potential and turn it into the game's ultimate weapon. Anastasia appeared as a powerful sword in Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings, and it could be obtained as part of the story in Chapter 7. But even though it was of decent strength, upon being obtained, it wasn't the strongest weapon in the game, as its base powers less than say the Durandal or Ultima Weapon. The true power of Anastasia could only be harnessed by finishing the Well of Whispered Oath, an optional location found deep within the Keep of Forgotten Time that housed some of the game's most powerful bosses. With each completed run of the Well of Whispered Oath, 10 points will be added to every stat except attack speed, which gained no boost, and speed, which gained 15 points. It meant that to maximise the stat gain, players would need to complete the Well of Whispered Oath 100 times, and upon doing so, they would be granted with a 999 point boost to every major stat except attack speed. That would take a considerable amount of time, but after Anastasia was maximised, the game would become beyond trivial, and it would be possible for Varn to solo the game's final boss, Fail Thanos Exultant, in under 20 seconds, assuming his dervish ability was also activated. For the penultimate entry on our list, we're going to delve into the realm of Final Fantasy XIV, which introduced a brand new array of incredibly powerful and difficult to obtain weapons as part of its Shadowbringers expansion. In the previous video, we spoke about the then ultimate weapons that could be obtained after beating the ultimate difficulty raid called the Weapons Refrain, but the bar was raised in significant manner following the introduction of a new ultimate difficulty raid called the Epic of Alexander, which was added as part of patch 5.11, Vows of Virtue, Deeds of Cruelty. Unlike many of the other weapons on this list, which have required players to either have a lot of luck or patience alongside a high degree of skill, the acquisition of the most powerful weapons in Final Fantasy XIV is primarily down to skill, and not just on an individual level. 
Instead, it requires an entire team to be operating with maximum efficiency and coordination to guarantee success. And that notion has only been amplified following the release of the Epic of Alexander. The fight is split into four different phases, each of which increases in difficulty level. Players are forced to adapt to numerous challenges and downright unfair mechanics as they look to make their way through and ultimately defeat Perfect Alexander, and it cannot be stressed just how hard this is and how much concentration and studying is needed to make sure everything goes as perfectly as it possibly can. Upon victory, players gain access to an item called the Colossus Totem. This can then be traded to an NPC found in Idleshire called Batana for numerous ultimate weapons like Ultimate Anarchy, an awesome looking weapon for gunbreakers. And that brings us on to our last weapon in the list, Sightingrat. Final Fantasy XII introduced some agonizingly difficult weapons to obtain when it launched back in 2006, with the Zodiac Spear causing by far the most frustration. Unbeknownst to the player, they could be penalised for opening four specific chests on their natural progression through the game. The first two resided in different parts of Rabanasta, the third was in the Nalbina dungeons, and the fourth was way later in the Fon coast, hidden amongst a selection of 16 chests. When the party arrived in the Necrol of Nabadis, they would be again granted with a selection of 16 chests. If none of the aforementioned four had been opened, then the Zodiac Spear could be found in the second chest from the left on the front row, but only if another hidden requirement had been met, none of the party were allowed to have the diamond armlets equipped. It meant that acquiring the Zodiac Spear was riddled with hidden criteria that without a guide were near impossible to predict, and it was very unfair. Having been granted full directorial control for its enhanced version, which was dubbed Final Fantasy XII International Zodiac Job System, Hiroyuki Ito decided to build upon this concept to make the acquisition of a brand new weapon called Sightingrat even more extreme and unfair. But there was at least a saving grace, as perhaps because this new weapon existed, the method of acquisition for the Zodiac Spear was at least softened. Sightingrat was introduced in this new version as one of the two new ultimate weapons. It featured 224 attack power and had incredible range, and due to its ability to significantly shift the balance of power, Ito decided to make his acquisition, through conventional means at least, even more difficult. Sightingrat could appear in a chest that only had a 1% chance of spawning on the air deck of the Sky Fairy, and it was invisible, so the only way you'd be able to find the chest was by randomly bumping into it. If it did spawn, then that's where things got even more interesting, if you didn't have the diamond armlet equipped, the Sightingrat would never appear in the chest when opened. Instead, you'd be greeted with a wonderful knot of rust or a small amount of gill. If you did, however, have the diamond armlet equipped, then there was a 5% chance the Sightingrat would be housed within, but even still, this meant there was only a 0.01% chance of acquiring the weapon each time the deck was entered. It is, however, possible to manipulate the spawn rates, and there are now numerous guides available for how to go about doing so. We'd recommend this one from Fuzzfinger Gaming, which covers the PlayStation 4 version, but there are numerous other guides out there for helping you to manipulate the random number generation on other platforms. But yeah, with that, I think we're done. They were 7 more of the hardest ultimate weapons to obtain. Let us know in the comments below which you have found to be the most difficult, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Rainy Eckham, Logan Nije, Benjamin Snow and Gregory, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.